always happy to hear from you, especially if you have any questions about my patients. I'm always happy to take a phone call. I have uh, been assigned a really thrilling topic today. I'm going to talk about sensory and motor physiology of uh, um, uh, strabismus and um, ophthalmology in general. Um, they like to ask lots of these questions on the boards and on the OCAPs and things. Um, a horopter is the locus of points between, you know, in space, or, so the locus of points in space that fall on the same part of the retina, so, you know, where you will have singular vision because they're the, sem the same, you're going to see the same out of either eye. Um, however, Panem's area, whoops, how do I go back, is a little bit bigger. And it's the area, it's the area where um, the points may lie on a little bit different part of the retina, but you're still just going to see one because the eye can kind of move that way and uh, bring it into one. So anything within Panem's area or within that horopter, you're just you're going to see one. Um, whereas things outside of that, you're going to you're going to see uh, double. Um, this is just a little bit uh, different way to. Um, diagram that where the horopter here is just this line here so that's the area where you're looking at something that's going to lie on the exact same part at the back of the retina whereas Panem's area is a little bit bigger um, and it's the area wherein you can fuse your eyes together to bring one image together to get stereoscopic vision. So what is oops, uh, fusion? So fusion is the ability of your eye to see one so it's your eye pulling two images you know looking at something out of one eye and then the other eye and making it and your brain making it one. Um, uh, they have to be similar in shape and size, which is why sometimes, you know, um, which is why when somebody's really anisometropic and has a lot of myopia in one eye, especially if it's new, after cataract surgery, they're going to see two because they can't, their brain can't pull those images together. Um, uh, they also can't tolerate much dissimilarity between the images, which is something you would see in something like macular degeneration, where the image out of one eye is going to be a little wavy because they've got, you know, uh, some ectodate or something or diabetic retinopathy, where they're, they're, the retinas are making things, you know, they look out of one eye and they, when they look at the um, Amsler grid, you know, they tell you there's wavy things. So the images are not the same with, with either eye. Um, and they can't pull them together and this can make it tough for people sometimes when they start having that they start to get a little bit of strabismus but even when you fix their strabismus they're still intermittently diplopic because they can't pull those images together because they're not the same shape um, and um, the receptive fields in the periphery are larger I think that that means that the um, that in the in the periphery your vision's not as clear and things and so you can do, you can tolerate a little bit more um, uh, dissimilarity. So sensory fusion uh, is the relationship between the retinas and the visual cortex, whereas images on corresponding retinal points combine to form a, a single image. That's kind of what I was talking about with that Panem's area. Even though they're they can be a little bit off, they can pull it together to make it one. Um, uh, motor fusion. So, so sensory fusion talks about how they have to, you know, kind of be similar to be able to pull it into one. Motor fusion, you know, is, is something you see when you when you put the prism bar up in, in front of one eye and you make the you make the eyes exotropic, and most people can pull it back in and make it one together. So their eyes can move to pull those images into a similar part of the retina, um, so that they can make it one. Um, stereopsis is what we test with the titmus or with the randot. Um, uh, and it adds unique quality to vision, you know, binocular vision. What is that? So when you look at these, you know, here, uh, the top dot in the, you know, usually, I can't always remember because I get these two confused because we have one in the clinic with nine and one in the clinic with ten and they're a little bit different. But um, these, the glasses that they wear are polarized, you know, for one eye and the other eye. So this top one the right eye sees it a little bit differently than the left eye, but when the brain looks at it, it pulls it together, but gives it kind of a, a, an appearance of coming off the page. So it's it's what you you know the same same concept as as seeing a 3D movie. 
Um, and, you know, as you go down, the, the, this Titmus test only has nine, the Randot has ten, but, you know, the further you go down, the more fine their stereo is, the more, the, the, the less these images are, are dissimilar and, and the more that they, they, can, they can pull it together. Um, uh, this is kind of a quick and easy way um, to uh, tell if somebody you know has strabismus if they have amblyopia and things because you have to have two good eyes to be able to see this. So someone who has you know amblyopia, significant amblyopia, they're not going to be able to see these images pull, coming out. Similarly, with somebody with strabismus, um, unless it's an intermittent strabismus, they're not going to be able to see these because they don't see well. You have to have two good two good eyes to be able to see things in stereo. This is another thing I use in my clinic. The other guys don't use it so much, but it's a, you don't have to put glasses on and the kids can kind of see these um, and they're different. Uh, this is like 600 arc seconds, this is uh, 1200 arc seconds. Um, sometimes it's a little bit easier for the kids. Uh, sometimes I like to use it in kids who have intermittent XT just to make sure that they do have stereo. So a lot of those kids with intermittent XT do not become amblyopic and so I just kind of follow them over time, especially if their control is pretty good, but just want to make sure they have stereo. Also, it's a, you know, an easy way to, to see if somebody, if a kid has, uh, before you dilate them, if they have uh, amblyopia. Um, gross stereo is just, the, you know, this, the fly, usually 3,000 3, seconds. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell if the kid really sees it or not. You can't ask him, do the wing, wings pop up? Because most all kids will tell you that anyway. But if they really kind of go to try to grab the wings or if they kind of try to scoop up the wings, we say it's positive. If they just put their hand on it and go straight down into it, we usually say it's negative. But sometimes it can be a little tricky to know exactly if they're seeing it or not. Um, because somebody doesn't see things on that, on the, on the stereopsis, if they don't have stereopsis, if they don't, if they can't see any of those images popping up, it doesn't mean that they don't have depth perception. And parents always get that confused. Um, there are lots of other things that contribute to depth perception. You know, these kids can still be, at, you know, still be athletes and do those kinds of things. They probably won't be a, like a major league baseball player or something because I think that there's something that goes with seeing that spin on that ball or things that you know you have to have really fine stereo. I mean, I think it'd be an interesting test to look at like major league baseball players or look at really good tennis players or things. I bet they all have excellent stereo acuity. But, you know, uh, it's not synonymous with stereopsis. You know, there's lots of other things like image over, uh, object overlap, object size, highlights and shadows, perspective. There are lots of other things that get contributed to, to depth perception. So when a kid comes in and, you know, the parents say, oh, they don't have any depth perception. They do have some depth perception. It's maybe not the same. And I think some of these kids are slower to walk, are slower to get some of those stereo skills, probably aren't going to be a stellar athlete either. But it doesn't mean that they don't have depth perception. Because um, uh, what we're talking about with that, you know, that stereopsis test is just this benign, binocular sensation of relative depth perception caused by that tiny horizontal disparity. Um, you know, you can see when you look with one eye or look with both eyes, there's a little difference, but it's not a huge difference um, between them. You still have some depth perception if you just have one eye. Um, and the, tr the truth is, after you get out about 10 or 20 feet, you're really relying on monocular cues, not so much that, uh, that binocular vision. Um, you know, as you guys know, your eyes are at the front of your head and your brain where you process the image of things is at the back. So, you know, those radiations have to travel a long way, uh, which is why most kids who have any kind of neurologic issue often have strabismus because anything that affects, you know, the brain, sometimes those radiations don't get all the way to the back and they don't have great binocular vision and I think that's why, you know, why they start to drift in or out. Um, they also, you know, have this decussation where the, the outside fibers uh, do not cross and the inside fibers usually, d you know, do cross. Um, uh, one area where they don't is albinism, and those kids usually do not have great stereo uh, vision. You know, some of them do have some stereo vision because there are varying degrees of that. You know, there are some kids with albinism who have pretty close to 20-20 vision, and then there are other kids who have 20-200, and I think the amount of decussation goes with the severity of the disease, but they usually, in general, don't have as good of uh, uh, binocularity because those radiations don't travel the same way. Um, 
and as you know, those the, you know it goes through the eye, through the lateral geniculate nucleus, through you know through the brain into the back, or the, to the visual cortex where things are interpreted. I never think about these, but they always like to put them in those books. I never saw, I remember seeing any questions on any of the tests about any of these, but the magnocellular uh, cells are uh, represented in the peripheral retina. They're especially sensitive to moving stimuli. They're insensitive to color, whereas the parvocellular uh, ones are the ones that are usually located more in the fovea, um, which have your high-res info about borders and color. Um, important for seeing detail and the conial cellular are the ones that they don't know as much about, maybe related to seeing the color blue. Um, when you're born, your uh, vision is not normal. Some of that is because your fovea is not totally formed, which can make some of these tests kind of difficult, especially, you know, Dr. Creel has that test where he, he uses the fact that those uh, kids with albinism, those fibers don't decussate, the nasal fibers don't decussate in kids with albinism. And so he measures the time from, you know, stimulus to the back of the brain and he, and he notices a difference in, in, in that wavelength in these kids with albinism. But some of these kids, um, uh, these tests are not usually, are often not conclusive when they're in really young kids because things are still developing right after birth. Um, so the fovea is covered by multiple cell layers. You know, you can't often see a great foveal reflex, which can make it even tougher to d diagnose an um, things like an albinism because you don't see a fovea in a normal kid, so you don't know that you're looking at a uh, kid with albinism, uh, especially if they're really young because you haven't developed any of that nystagmus yet. Some of those kids with albinism don't develop nystagmus. Um, uh, but the photoreceptors move around a little bit, um, and they, the cones really concentrate in that, in that foveal area. Um, the white matter, you know, starts myelinating during the first two years, which is why those kids then can be able to uh, walk. Um, neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus, to, uh, lateral geniculate body, geniculate body increase in size, um, uh, and things continue to change through the first few years of life. Um, while this is developing and changing, any disruption of that can lead to um, uh, amblyopia. So a cataract, anything that blurs the visual axis, anisometropia that's significant, or strabismus um, that's significant. Uh, uh, they've also found that uh, in monkeys that have had their eyelids sutured to simulate amblyopia, their lateral geniculate lamina shrink mildly. So it is, you know, and this is kind of something I sometimes say to parents when they don't understand why the glasses aren't fixing the amblyopia. Because amblyopia is a brain disease. So they can actually look at those monkeys and see that those kids with, those monkeys with amblyopia don't have the same brain on either side because it hasn't grown and they can see that microscopically. Um, you know, and they, they start to narrow, these ocular dominance columns start to narrow. Um, what happens in these amblyopic uh, monkeys is that the open, the open eye starts growing new neurons to occupy areas that were usually um, where the neurons from the deprived eye usually are. So the amblyopic eye, I mean, the, the strong eye starts taking over the space where there usually was, uh, were neuronic uh, connections from the um, amblyopic eye. But there's no real benefit to having more, you know, to having these neurons grow because the visual acuity, I mean, although it's usually 20, 20, 20, 15, it, it doesn't seem to have, be bionic or any better than a normal eye. Um, they've also shown that, you know, PET scans uh, have shown that there's increased blood flow to, and glucose metabolism um, during stimulation of the amblyopic eye. Um, And, and this, and when they leave it that way, and then open the eye, these cells, you know, you know, cannot be regenerated. So, in a normal eye, with a normal patient with two eyes, you know, the cells are are, are both eyes are driving it. But in the amblyopic eye, it's only being driven by one eye. Um, so, this critical period is the time. Um, during which um, in, in the monkey studies, so they've done lots of studies on monkeys and kittens where they suture one eye shut, 
they leave it shut for a few weeks and then they open it up and then they look at their brain and, and see what is this exact critical period. Um, so it's the, it's the time during which they can open up the eye that they've sutured and try to get normal vision back. Um, we don't always know what this is. Um, in kids, you know, they used to think it was about eight years old that we couldn't treat amblyopia past, but now they PDIG did a study a couple of years ago where even kids up to 13 years old when they treated anisotropic amblyopia um, with glasses or patching, if they hadn't been treated before, they could improve the, the vision. They've also shown, you know, they've also done some studies where even people who, you know, have an amblyopic eye and then they have injury, they have a ruptured globe or something and lose vision in their good eye, the vision in that amblyopic eye, even in adults, can improve a little bit. Um, when they've done trials to try to do that, uh, improve it by patching in adults, usually they can improve it a tiny bit, but when they stop patching, it goes away. So there, there is some plasticity even in adults, but we don't know exactly what this critical period is in kids, and that can always make things difficult because parents will always want to stop patching, but you never know when you stop patching, are you out of the critical period or not. As they get older, it gets less, but you don't really know exactly what that is because it, it varies with the kind of amblyopia they have and the severity of the amblyopia they have. So you often kind of have to stop, uh, try tapering off and then, and then seeing. But you know, it's somewhere between eight and 13, but some of those kids where they come in with dense, dense amblyopia because they've had a cataract removed and they, had, they didn't patch after, they lost the contact for a long time, that critical period's closed even sooner. So um, this is always a difficult thing because we don't know exactly when this is. So what is amblyopia? Like I said, it's a brain disease. So it's decreased visual acuity in a normal, when you do an exam on a kid and they have decreased acuity in one eye versus the other eye, but there's nothing structurally going on um, that explains it and, and, and then you deduce that it's from the brain. Um, usually in those kids you can explain it though. You know, I have a couple of kids where I, you know, they have amblyopia and I don't know why and you know, you assume they probably had some anisometropy or something that they grew out of, but sometimes you just really don't know. Um, but the biggest causes are strabismus where the eyes aren't aligned, so they choose one and ignore the other. Anisometropic, and it's much more in hyperopic kids than in, in much more when you have a hyperopic difference than if you have a myopic difference, you know. If you have a kid with a plus one and a plus three, they're much more likely to develop amblyopia than that minus one, minus three kid. Um, and uh, high bilateral refractive errors. So these are people with high plus prescriptions, less likely high minus prescriptions, but can happen with that too. And then kids who have four, five, six diopters of astigmatism. Um, uh, so anisometropia, why does that cause, uh, why does that cause amblyopia? Um, because, you know, when a kid's a plus one and a plus three, they got to work harder to use that plus three eye, so they just won't be able to use the plus one eye. So that plus three eye is going to stay two diopters defocused. It's going to be two diopters blurry, and that they're just, their brain's going to learn to see two diopters blurry out of that eye. Um, has a later onset critical period than, than strabismic amblyopia. That's like what I was saying, the kids with cataracts, you know, their amblyopia usually, if you don't treat it in the first, you know, months to years of life, they're, they're never going to develop normal vision. Whereas this, you have a couple more years, even those kids that were 13 years old who had anisometropic amblyopia, you could treat at that age. Um, and usually, uh, astigmatism uh, doesn't cause amblyopia the first year and may not develop until age three. This is kind of a funny one because now, um, Insurance companies are, are reimbursing for the use of those um, vision screeners in the clinics, and they always pick up a couple diopters of astigmatism and send them to you. But when I see a kid who's a one or two with three diopters of astigmatism, I just watch them because a lot of these kids have astigmatism. Their eyelids are tight, so they're pushing on their eye and causing that eye to have astigmatism, especially at 90. Um, and, but it's not going to be amblyo, amblyogenic at this age, and those kids aren't going to want to keep their glasses on, and their vision is usually going to develop normally, and oftentimes they'll outgrow some of that astigmatism. So, um, uh, even if it's anisometropic, um, I usually sit on it for a little while. So how often are they using it? Like in the <laughs> they use it like in the nine-month-old, but it's often wrong because the kids don't look fix it, you know, they don't fixate yeah. on that target. Yeah. So it's kind of a bad test because then it just sends more and more kids yeah. our way that that usually don't have anything. And the truth is, when they have, even when they have anisometropia, I'm not going to do anything about them. I usually sit on them for a while. And so. The, um, the pediatric ophthalmology group doesn't have like a recommendation for the general pediatric 
no, no, we haven't gotten together to make it of that. You know, and those vision screeners are a little bit different in terms of, I have had some practice, at least one practice that's emailed me their cutoffs to tell me what they would do for it. And I just kind of said, well, I wouldn't do it in the young kids because it's just not accurate. Um, uh, but no, and there's no consensus nationwide on, on, on how to keep those either. Um, but everybody's doing it now because they're getting paid for it. So they, and they take a chunk of that reimbursement, so they like using them now. Um, but the truth is, uh, these young kids, when they pick up, I've only had a couple that were good pickups, not very many, most of them are negative. Or even if they are there, I sit on them for a while and don't do anything, and some of them have grow up, so. Um, strabismus, you know, those things are supposed to pick up on strabismus too, but if they're not, fit, you know, and how do they do that? They can tell that there's a different reflex when one eye's crossed, but, you know, the pediatrician should be able to pick up on that, but honestly, in my experience, parents are better than pediatricians. I mean, pediatricians send me a couple pseudo strabismus a day, and, you know, the parents are like, well, I didn't notice anything, and pediatricians, I mean, usually, and usually the parents are better than the kids on, on the pseudo strabismus, but, you know, strabismus, why do they get amblyopia? Because they're not, their phobias aren't lined up. You know, they're using one eye and the phobia is lined up and the, the eye that's crossed is not using that phobia. Um, and it's critical periods earlier too. So, um, and Bob always says this too, that these anisometropic amblyopia are much easier to treat than these strabismic amblyopia. So when they have a mix of that, you know, uh, patch, 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 and you're still not, sometimes can't get, can't get that vision 2020. It's just really hard. Um, Suppression um, is what happens, you know, it's, it's an adaptation really. Uh, you know, when, it, when you're strabismic, evolutionarily, you would want to get rid of the image that's giving you double vision. So those kids who are born with strabismus, they're starting to turn that eye off, which leads to amblyopia. So, you know, why, why do they get amblyopia? Well, it's an it's a evolutionary adaptation, but it does, it's not always a good one if we can treat it. Um, uh, so they start to turn off that eye, so those kids have an area where they, they aren't able to, um, uh, they turn off the image and they don't see it. Uh, the thing that's weird is why with crossing ET do they get amblyopic and with XT they rarely get amblyopic. They don't know. But most of those kids with bad XTs still are 20-20 in each eye and still have stereo vision. Um, but those ETs don't. Um, so patients with strabismus and normal retinal correspondence um, without diplopia uh, suppress. So this just means that if you've got a kid with strabismus who comes in and tells you they don't have double vision, it's because they're turning that one eye off. Um, so you want to try to treat that, treat that suppression. Um, and usually with kids, with kids with amblyopia, we start by putting them in their right glasses. If they're still not equal in their vision, then we start doing patching and or atropine. Trouble, you know, atropine seems easier but for those dense cases, you wonder, like, the, the atropine's only blurring them up close unless they're, you know, got a high hyperopic prescription. And if you aren't blurring them enough to make it, you know, to make the, the good eye the bad eye, you know, it may not be working, although they've shown that even when it doesn't blur it enough, so even when they look up close, with it, when they, they're using atropine and their good eye is still clearer than their bad eye, they still do have some improvement in their vision. Other trouble with atropine is you can't flip kids. And so if you don't see them back enough, you can make their good eye their bad eye, and if they keep using that atropine, it's just gonna get worse and worse and worse. Um, and then, you know, there is some thought, even these kids, when you haven't fully treated the amblyopia, the thought is, if you do surgery to try to get their eyes straighter, is that gonna treat the amblyopia? Is getting rid of that strabismus to make them straighter? You know, usually the general teaching is treat the amblyopia, make that vision better, and, and then, you know, the straighter, then they're more likely to stay straight after surgery. But, you know, the flip side of that is sometimes doing surgery makes that eye closer. So, you know, a kid who has a huge esotropia that takes them a lot of effort to flip between the two eyes, if you get them pretty close and they're only flipping a little bit, they're going to use that amblyopic eye a little bit more. Um, uh, treating that suppression is, is uh, a, a little bit tougher on these kids that aren't able to fuse because they're always... Um, these are kids who, even when you do surgery, they still have a little bit of atropia, and like I said, those are the ones that are harder to treat because they really never use their eyes together. Anomalous retinal correspondence just means that they, when they, when they're, when they do, when they are using their eyes together, 
their retinas aren't corresponding with the same spot, so the fovea in one eye is not matching up with the fovea in the other eye. Um, and uh, so it acquires an anomalous common visual direction with the peripheral retina elevate and the deviated eye. So the deviated eye, there's a little area off the fovea that, you know, that corresponds to the fovea in the other eye. Um, and these are like the people who, you know, some of them who have like monofixation or things like that. So it's an adaptation, it's an evolutionary adaptation to restore some amount of binocularity despite their strabismus. Um, and uh, sometimes it can make things a little bit tricky after surgery when you line them up, they see a little bit of diplopia, but usually it kind of goes away. Um, you can test for this. Um, uh, so um, by putting a, a red lens in front of, you know, in front of the, the, so let me see here, I can't remember how this works on this one. Oh, so if their phobias are, so this is their pseudophobia, and this is the phobia here, and somebody who has this, you have them look through a red lens here, and they see this uh, light as pink. Um, whereas, you know, this would be somebody who has anomalous retinal correspondence because they're looking at their pseudophobia and their phobia. Whereas this is somebody who, you know, they're using their phobia and their phobia, and you put, you know, a prism in here, you put a, a base out prism um, to make them exotropic, um, uh, and then you put a red lens here as well. And so um, what you're finding here is that they, that they have crossed. Yeah, you're making them exotropic too. So they're going to have cross diplopia um, uh, when they're looking with their real phobia. So this is this is this is a normal person. This is one with uh, uh, anomalous retinal correspondence. I have to think about these things too because we never <laughs> we never really use them. Um, but this is a red glass test that looks for um, anomalous retinal correspondence in somebody with ET. So um, this is somebody who's looking at an image here. They've got a right ED of 20 prism diopters. They're looking here with their fovea here. Um, and uh, they've got uncrossed diplopia, which you, you know, corresponds with uh, esotropia, or um, they, su they, they suppress, depending on, what, on, on which side they're looking at. Um, if you... Uh, Correct some of that esotropia with you know five prism diopters, but you know that they're really twenty. Then they start to see one. So you're only correcting some of it, but they're you know they're starting to to the, they aren't diplopic at all. Whereas if you correct the whole twenty prism diopters, um, you know which is sometimes why you should you know when you're testing these people, you know you do a cover on cover test, you do the alternate prism cover test. You're trying to build up as most e the biggest number you can because you're trying to figure out what you should operate on for surgery. You, you get up to a 20 and you put the 20 there and, and then they start seeing crossed diplopia, um, which is, you know, make, means that they're XT. So uh, this is just somebody who, you know, their 20 prism diopters esotropic. However, when you put a 20 prism diopter, when you put a 20 diopter prism in front of them, you know, you make them exotropic. So that they're, when, you're line, when you line them up with their actual physiologic phobias, they're having double vision. Um, this is just the same thing telling you that. So, um, and, and usually crossed diplopia is exotropia and uncrossed is esotropia. This is somebody with normal retinal correspondence. Um, and uh, uh, so when they're looking off their, looking off their fovea, they're seeing things correctly. Worth four dot um, is something I like to use in clinic a lot because, you know, I, especially in adults and things you want to know if they can fuse, if they, if they are a fuser. Um, and, um, you know, you put these glasses on, you put the red over the right eye, the green over the left eye. Then with the right eye, they see two red. With the left eye, they see three green. And then you just ask them what they see. Um, usually for these kids who, you know, and they should see four up close and four a distance, whereas these amblyopic kids are going to see, you know, whichever, if their right eyes cross, they're going to see three green up close and far away. Some of them are a little bit intermittent. Um, some of them it's kind of hard because they'll tell you they see all of them, but they don't really see them all at the same time. They're suppressing and alternating between the two. Um, the other thing you can figure out too is if they have a monofixation syndrome. So um, if they have some amount of 
where their fovea in one eye lines up with a little bit of the peripheral fovea in the other eye, and they will usually fuse up close but suppress far away. So that's the way you can tell about monofixation. Um, so if they see five lights, they don't usually have suppression, um, but you have to figure out are they seeing five lights at the same time or are they crossed and flipping between the two eyes and they see three, you know, they see two red and three green, three red and three green. And that's, in kids, that's usually what it is. They usually are not diplopic. Kids are not usually diplopic. If they're diplopic, there's a problem because it means it's a new, it's a new sensory strabismus. Um, and, you know, to pick up on nonal fixation syndrome, um, you, they usually suppress at distance and fuse it near. Um, some of these are kind of tricky because sometimes when you do the alternate prism cover test, they often won't like move, <laughs> so you can't tell. But it's you know kids who come in and are like a 20, 20, 20, 30, 40 in the other eye. They usually don't have that bad of, of uh, amblyopia. They usually have some amount of you know peripheral fusion with a little scotoma. Um, they usually uh, sometimes have stereoacuity, but it's usually reduced. They have a little bit of amblyopia. Um, it's considered a good outcome after strabismus surgery. So these are the kids that you operate for a congenital ET of 40 to 50, and then after they have an ET of like 8 to 10. Um, they aren't straight, but their brain can't make them straight. This is what Bob likes to use. I don't really ever use these, but um, they have these dots here. Um, and they, you usually put the right eye at 135 and the left eye at 45. And then, um, you know, in the people who are normal, they'll see an X. If they're suppressing the left eye, they're only going to see the one, uh, you know, the right eye that goes this way. Um, I don't know how you would tell this. I, I don't know that people would really be able to tell you this, but I've never really used this test, so I don't know. But, you know, in those monofixators where they have that compression scotoma in one eye, they might tell you that there's a break in that eye in the middle. Um, then, you know, if you have esotropia with normal retinal correspondence, you're going to have uncrossed diplopia and a V here. Uh, whereas if you have uh, exotropia, you're going to have cross diplopia. Uh, you know, so you're, you're seeing your right eye over here and your left eye over here. These tests are kind of hard because unless you use them a lot, you kind of have to sit and think about them for a minute, and then you, when you're seeing them on a test, you kind of will overthink them sometimes. So, um, but they do like to ask them. Um, after image testing is another way of doing the same thing, um, where you, uh, um, you know, shine a, you label the fovea by sh shining some lights, and then have them, you know, see the after image in their eyes. Um, in somebody with normal retinal correspondence, they're going to. Uh, bring across here. These are from your book. Your uh, I can't think of what they call those. Those AAO books. But I think this test. This one's a little bit funny. So these are people with anomalous retinal correspondence, where you know they have uh, they they um, are seeing things off here. But I don't like this image because. I never like to think about things in terms of anomalous retinal correspondence. But this is somebody who, um, so if they are right over here, so this is really, they're seeing it exotropic, but they are esotropic, so it's just off. Amblyoscope, we don't have one of these. Sometimes on the boards, they like to show you weird devices and say, what is this? <laughs> Um, but it's a way that you can have somebody sit in there and dial things in to really figure out what their ocular alignment is. It can be really helpful for torsional diplopia, um, and uh, you know you you have that you dial them in to figure out exactly you know what their eye alignment is in a certain direct, direction of gaze. Um, and you can also use it for some people use it for like building up amplitudes in terms of fusional or uh, divergence uh, amplitudes. Um, so it neutralizes the torsion. Um, it, t it can tell why somebody can't fuse. You know, in some of these cases, is it because of their um, retina or is it because they've got a huge amount of uh, torsion? Torsion can be tricky because people, you know, they can have, you, like especially for the bilateral superior obliques, you can be looking at them and they can have, you know, you do a cover on cover test and they have no deviation in down gaze. Maybe they have a tiny ET of three or four, but they tell you that they, you know, something's off with their vision and sometimes they can't even tell you that it's double vision or anything. <coughs> but the reason that they're not seeing is because of torsion. So, you know, you really do need to check for torsion, especially in cases where you have a little bit of a hyper 
um, because the torsion may be the problem, and, and sometimes they cannot uh, tell you that. They can't verbalize that. Um, amblyoscopy, yeah, like I said, you can use it for some exercises to overcome suppression, which can be a bad thing in some people. Some people are not able to fuse and they're suppressing, and if you get rid of that suppressed scotoma, then they're going to be very angry at you because they can't, you know, they're always going to be diplopic. Um, double mattis rod, this is the one I usually like to use. Um, you know, uh, you usually use a red lens and a white lens and, and then have the person dial in things to make things parallel with the ground or, you know, or this. I usually do parallel with the ground and parallel with each other. Um, sometimes if they're fusing it together, you can put a prism in there to make them, you know, base down prism to make one higher than the other and then you just make them parallel with each other um, so that they're not fusing it together. Uh, and then what you read off there is what they are. So if this lens is this way, in, you know, in this eye, they're X cyclotorted in this eye. Um, you know, if they're X cyclotorted in this eye and in cyclotorted in this eye, those are going to be parallel, so it's not an issue. But if they got a bunch of X cyclo in both eyes, um, you know, that's where your problem is. Um, you can die. You, you know, you can tolerate somewhere six, seven diopters of uh, torsion usually, but much more than that starts to be a problem. Um, Lancaster Red Green, these are, um, this is a test where you, um, this is the person giving the test and this is the person taking the test, you know, they have these lights on here and she, she shines a bean on, on, a, on a wall and then you, you know, the person taking the test should line it up and make it, you know, make it on top of each, theoretically make it on top of each other, but it's a way um, that you can tell, you know, patterns. You can't really tell how many diopters somebody's off, but you can tell. So this is somebody that's fixing, and usually the red is the right eye and the left is the, uh, sorry, this is red is the right eye and this was the left eye. So you can see that this person's misalignment is much more in down gaze, and their torsion also, you know, up here they're not so torted. Down here they have uh, quite a bit more torsion and quite a bit more uh, esotropia, um, and this is actually a patient with a, so it's a V pattern, bilateral superior oblique palsy. So this is somebody where in primary gaze, um, they aren't looking, you know, and these are the different directions of gaze. Um, they aren't so bad, but when they start looking down gaze, they, they get really torted and, and, in, and um, uh, horizontal misalignment. And that's it. A lot of talking. But in general, if your eyes aren't lining up, you know, you're either going to get double vision or you're suppressing. And, you know, these are different ways to kind of try to tease out what's going on. Um, you know, unless you're doing a lot of strabismus, you're not going to be working with it. But, you know, you are going to see these people with head trauma that tell you that um, something's off. And you know, you're going to look at them and think, oh, they're, um, they look pretty straight. I don't know what they're talking about. But, you know, sometimes if you aren't measuring at all positions of gaze, they may have a little, you know, quite a bit of torsional diplopia and just trying to figure that out can be a little bit tricky. So these are tests that sometimes help us tell that. You know, in general, we don't do a whole lot of these tests because, you know, even these suppression tests so much, um, there's so much of a element of uh, cosmesis in strabismus surgery. So oftentimes we'll do surgery and try to get them straight. And if they have a little bit of uh, allowable retinal correspondence, then we try to deal with that after. So um, that's about it.